My name is Nancy Fulton, and this is an interview with Sam Bachman, author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited. If I look up narcissistic personality disorder online, your book and articles and videos all come up on the first page, and links to your work continue for screen after screen, and your work is quoted and cited by almost everyone else who talks about the disorder. Can you describe how you came to be so well-known in regard to narcissistic personality disorder? In 1995, when I erupted on the scene with my insights and observations and so on and so forth, I was literally the only one online. There was no other website. There were no other people talking about the topic. There was a scattering of books, ponderous academic tomes, which dealt mainly with the dynamics of narcissism, but not with the impact narcissists have on others, nearest, dearest, and not so nearest or dearest. So it was an isolated, obscure, much neglected niche in abnormal psychology. And in 1995, when I embarked on the Herculean task of describing narcissism and then describing narcissism's effects, I had to invent neologisms, uh, coin new terms and phrases, or adopt old terms and phrases, like false self, or true self, or narcissistic supply. And then I invented terms like somatic narcissists, cerebral narcissists, and so on and so forth. So I was the first. And between 1995 and 2004, I had been the only one. By 2004, I was running communities with a membership in excess of 200,000 people. So the word spread. And then money started pouring in. I made money by selling books and DVDs and what have you. People noticed that I'm making money, especially academic vultures. And suddenly there was a proliferation of self-styled and self-imputed experts and scholars and what have you, all of them writing and selling books, all of them counseling narcissistic abuse victims, and all of them making a heck of a lot of money. So money, money drove the explosion of the field. Money made narcissism a buzzword. And money distorted the knowledge about narcissism and the priorities attached to its study and the implementation of the lessons that we cull. So is your interest in narcissism related to your having been diagnosed as having had the disease? or I, I, started, I started to study the, the disorder because I've been twice diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder in the span of a decade. Mm -hmm. And because my life went downhill or south, and I've hit rock bottom at least four or five times. And finally, it penetrated my thick skull that something might be wrong with me rather than the world. And so I started to, to study. But it's, it's been an uphill bat battle because the diagnosis of narcissistic personality disorder entered the, the profession's Bible, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, only in 1980. Mm. And prior to the mid-90s, there was no knowledge, understanding, database, nothing. There was nothing. No one knew anything about any of this. So it was an uphill battle. But slowly, slowly, I found like-minded therapists, numerous victims of narcissistic abuse, and um, about a thousand narcissists. They all collaborated, and they allowed me to gather a humongous database of, of what it's all about. Based on this database, I wrote books and so on. So but it all started with my own quest, with my as as most things do, mm -hmm. with my own quest for self self comprehension and then perhaps self modification. Wow, that's very impressive. So you're very careful not to position narcissists as being heroes or larger than life, and yet it is true that a lot of people who have narcissism are very effective. Sometimes they're very good things, sometimes they're very bad things. So they can be, some narcissists become cult leaders, some become very successful politicians, some become very successful surgeons, some become very successful um, actors, actresses and directors and producers. So can you explain why it is the case that narcissism seems to be associated with achievement for good or ill? <laughs> well, so I dispute the premise. It is not. It is not. I okay. dispute the premise. It is not. It is, what you have just said, is, is true in narcissistic civilizations, hmm. in narcissistic societies. But if you were a narcissist in a collectivist society, for instance, if you are a narcissist in, 
in, in Japan, or if you were to be a narcissist in the, in the Arab world, you would be mowed down, you'd be cut down. You will be the epitome of, of failure, not of success. Collectivist societies do not tolerate narcissists. They cut them down, they reduce them to size, and they prevent them from attaining any power, directly or indirectly. In collectivist societies, we have another phenomenon, which is collective narcissism. The, the collective itself professes superiority, or the collective itself is vain, and so on and so forth. So we have a, a phenomenon of collective narcissism. But we do not have individual narcissism or effective individual narcissism in these societies. You are an American, so your point of view is American or, by extension, Western. Indeed, Western society, and more so American society, and civilization, if there is such a thing, and culture, these are highly narcissistic. And in narcissistic environments, narcissists rise to the top. Because narcissistic cultures and societies and collectives place a premium over narcissistic traits and behaviors. They reward these traits and behaviors. They encourage them. They foster them. The whole education system is geared toward producing narcissists because narcissism in these societies is an adaptation. It really allows people to rise to the top, to leverage their qualities in order to attain power or money or sex or accomplishments, including intellectual accomplishments. It's all predicated on being a good card-carrying narcissist. But mind you, Western civilization is less than 20% of the world. In the vast majority of the rest of the world, Africa, huge parts of Asia, and so on and so forth, Narcissism, individual narcissism, is an unheard phenomenon and definitely is not coupled with success. That is very interesting. I had not, th I had never thought about that before. Would it be true to say that malignant narcissists are responsible for a lot of violence and crime in the world and also represent a uh, fairly large portion of the abuse of husbands, abuse of boyfriends, scam artists, corrupt politicians, and so forth? If, and if so, why is that the case? It's not so much about causing harm as about being ruthless and unscrupulous and relentless and, and fearless. Psychopaths especially are fearless and being an adrenaline junkie and lacking risk aversion and so on and so forth. It's, it's less about the personality disorder itself and more about its outcomes or its manifestations in both traits and modes of conduct or behavior. So narcissists and psychopaths behave in ways which tend to maximize returns on unusual behavior. And because their behavior is unusual, they are very disruptive. And because they are very disruptive, they tend to affect other people adversely. 90% of narcissistic and psychopathic behaviors are self-seeking, self-centered self-maximizing and self-optimizing. They have absolutely nothing to do with other people. Consequently, narcissists and psychopaths regard other people as bargaining chips, extensions, tools, instruments, cardboard cutouts. They're as props or, in the best case, as uh, machinery. So narcissists and psychopaths don't do things to people. They do things. And people happen to be on the way. So. This is first important distinction, that the narcissist's malice, or what, that narcissists are considered evil, is absolutely wrong-headed. Narcissists are not evil, no more than viruses are evil, or tornadoes, or tigers. Narcissists are what they are. They are a force of nature. They are there, simply there. If you happen to be in the way, and if you're not careful enough, not edified, and educated enough, not aware of the dangers, and not, not very self-protective, then you, you stand to pay the price, exactly as you would pay the price if you were to have unsafe sex, or gamble in casinos, or whatever. Working with narcissists, collaborating with narcissists, getting into, into an intimate relationship with a narcissist, and so on and so forth, is a risky behavior. 
it is your fault for ending up in these relationships, not the narcissist. The narcissist is simply there. Psychopaths, are, uh, psychopaths, some psychopaths are malicious, and they are evil, and these are the sadistic psychopaths. The psychopaths who derive pleasure from inflicting pain on other people. The psychopaths whose sense of grandiosity and omnipotence is supported and buttressed by their ability to minimize, humiliate, or even torture other people. But that's a very, very, very tiny minority, even of psychopaths, and it is an absolutely vanishing minority of narcissists. However, both narcissists and psychopaths seek to maximize returns. They seek to maximize return on their investment of grandiose gestures. They maximize returns on their attempts to convert fantasy to reality, etc., etc. And so, tend to abuse people only if they um, kind of constitute an obstacle. So narcissists divide the world into two groups. Potential sources of supply, those people who are able to provide them with attention, adulation, admiration, people who would fear them, even people who would hate them, but people who would notice them. All these people are considered sources of narcissistic supply, and the narcissist would not harm them, nor will he abuse them for as long as they continue to function properly as sources of supply. However, if they wish to revert to a more critical role, if they wish to criticize, to disagree, to deviate uh, from the narcissist's uh, plan or agenda and so on, if they stop being, if they cease to be sources of supply, then they become automatically enemies. Now this is called, this defense mechanism is called splitting. It is a primitive defense mechanism whereby you see the world in terms of with me or against me, black and white, good and evil. The narcissist is like that. If you are not a source of supply, you are not. And if you are not and insist on being, then you're an obstacle. And if you're an obstacle, you're an enemy. And if you're an enemy, you should be obliterated. Hence the abuse. Scams are more, more typical of psychopaths. And indeed, there is a huge confusion, especially in the media, especially in the mass media, and in, in Hollywood, since we, <laughs> we will be discussing Hollywood. Yes. In all, in all popular portrayals of narcissists and psychopaths, there is a huge confusion and a huge admixture of narcissistic and psychopathic traits. For example, scam artists, criminals, they are usually psychopaths, not narcissists. Antisocial behavior and criminalized behavior are typical usually of psychopaths. Narcissists are usually soci socially conformist. They conform to society and its rules. They play the game. And they play by the rules because they want to rise to the top, and they do rise to the top, and they become pillars of the community, and therefore narcissists are actually the underpinnings of the establishment itself. They are the establishment. They become top-level politicians. They become chief executive officers. They become the establishment. They make the rules. Why should they break them? Psychopaths, on the other hand, are outcasts and outlaws. They are antisocial, they are criminalized. They seek to impose their own rules on society. They avoid religiously conventions, mores, rules of conduct, and so on. They are a law unto themselves. They are usually lone wolves. They are merciless. They are ruthless, etc. etc. So these are two completely distinct type, types of people. They, they lie on the same spectrum. They're, they have many things in common. For example, they both lack uh, empathy, which we will be discussing later. But they are distinct in how they interact with society and with other people. Whereas the narcissist seeks to leverage other people to further his grandiose and fantastic agenda, the psychopath seeks to demolish and obliterate other people and feed off the skeletons and the ruins and the corpses left in its wake. So that actually was very, very interesting. Um, and I had never heard that distinction drawn between psychopaths and narcissists. 
let's take two seconds to talk about the difference between narcissists or people who have who are high on a set of narcissistic traits versus people who have narcissistic personality disorder versus people that are psychopaths because I think that there is a huge problem in lumping all of those people together because they don't they don't behave the same and they don't translate into the same outcomes so can you sort of address the difference between yeah. somebody who's high who's high on the traits and what those traits are and then discuss people who actually have the specific disorder um, and then talk about how psychopaths are a minority of that of that small fraction or a completely different species altogether being a narcissist I will reverse the order and I will start by discussing the distinction between narcissists and psychopaths mm -hmm. and then we will discuss the narcissistic spectrum mm -hmm. so let's start with narcissists and psychopaths because I, I will segue into my previous response. Narcissists and psychopaths, as I said, are on the same spectrum because they both share very important psychodynamic traits. For example, they like empathy. But as opposed to narcissists, psychopaths are unable or unwilling to control their impulses. They have no impulse control. They cannot delay gratification. They are very childlike psychopaths, actually. They want it and they want it now. And, you know, there's nothing that can allay their need to have everything right now. They can't control their impulses, so they rage a lot. And they rage in order to control people and manipulate them into submission. Narcissists rage when they are frustrated in their quest to attain the grandiose heights of their self-perception. When they are confronted with reality, which is drab and shabby, and not up to their belief of how they should be. When there is a contrast between reality and grandiose inflated self-image, the narcissist rages. And if you happen to be the one who introduces this contrast into the narcissist's life, the narcissist will rage at you. But psychopaths rage is a control, a tool of control and manipulation. And, and they rage because they cannot delay gratification and because they have very poor impulse control. Psychopaths like narcissists lack empathy. But psychopaths, as opposed to narcissists, some psychopaths, as opposed to narcissists, are sadistic. They take pleasure in inflicting pain or deceiving people. It, it cause, it, they even find it funny. Many psychopaths will burst out laughing after having inflicted a horrible damage or pain on someone. Narcissists don't have that. Narcissists don't derive pleasure from abusing people or scamming them or controlling them. It's not a question of they derive the pleasure from the fact that their grandiose self-image is thus reasserted, reaffirmed. So if they control someone, or if they abuse someone, or if they manipulate someone, it's not about the manipulation itself, or the, or the abuse itself. They don't derive pleasure from the act of abusing. They don't derive pleasure from inflicting pain. They derive pleasure from the fact that this confirms to them that they are godlike. It's a very subtle distinction, but it's a very important one. The psychopath has no grandiose self-image. The psychopath doesn't care what you think about him. The psychopath is not dependent on narcissistic supply. The psychopath can and does live very well under the radar with no attention, no admiration, no adulation. Actually, many psychopaths find any type of human contact to be overbearing and, and uh, you know, uh, repulsive. While narcissists are addicted, addicted to human contact, they are dependent on other people because they need narcissistic supply. And without narcissistic supply, they crumble, like the proverbial vampire. So psychopaths are less able to form interpersonal relationships, even, you know, even romantic relationships, family relationships. Psychopaths are very bad at maintaining any type of prolonged contact with other humans. Not so narcissists. Narcissists work with other people to further their own goals. They build teams and motivate them, as we have seen in, in cases in Silicon Valley, in politics. Many narcissists have very stable families. Many narcissists work in, a sing, in the same company for four decades and then rise to the top as chief, ex, chief executive officer. So narcissists are stable, they have long-term goals, they can delay gratification, and they are not bad at all in working and interacting with other people 
as long as these people agree to a subservient position of furthering the Gnosis' goals, enhancing his grandiosity, and providing him with supply. Not so psychopaths. Psychopaths, even the most well-meaning psychopaths, are unable to work with other people. Both psychopaths and narcissists disregard society, think that society is composed of very inferior people. They regard themselves as the next stage in human evolution, superior, and so on, so they are not amenable to being subjected to, it, to society's conventions, to social cues and rules, social treaties, to mores, and so on. They are above all that. But the psychopath carries this conviction and this disdain to the extreme. Psychopath is scheming, calculated, ruthless, callous, career criminal. The biggest studies of psychopaths are conducted in prisons. Mm. About the spectrum of narcissism. The problem we have when we try to wrap our, ha our head around the concept of pathological narcissism, we often have problems. We, people often tell me, I can't believe such people exist, and so on and so forth. And the reason this is happening is because deep inside, we all have a small narcissist. According to Freud and, and others, healthy narcissism develops during the formative years, childhood, very early childhood, up to the age of six. Healthy narcissism is the foundation upon which we later develop self-confidence, self-esteem, and a stable sense of self-worth. Sense of self-worth that is not dependent on input from the outside, but derives from inner strength and from inner conviction as to who you are and what are your shortcomings and advantages, limitations and abilities. So this sense of self-worth predicated on healthy narcissism is with, with us, with each and every one of us. The healthier the narcissism, the healthier the sense of self-worth, the healthier mentally the person in question. Now what happens is, when childhood is disrupted in ways which we can discuss later, this healthy narcissism remains with us even when we grow up and then it takes over and it becomes pathological narcissism. Instead of allowing the person to develop and flower and flourish, to become a full-fledged adult with the ability to have meaningful interpersonal relationships, function in a variety of settings such as workplace and so on, Instead of this, what happens is the child remain, the, the adult remains stuck in childhood, where all the delusions of childhood narcissism, for example, omnipotence, I know everything, um, uh, omnipotence, I am all-powerful, omniscience, I know everything, all these delusions of childhood, which are very important, the child should be delusional up to a certain point, in order to venture into the world and be adventurous, adventurous enough to take the world, to take on the world, but as the interaction between adult and world proceeds, these sharp angles of narcissism are eroded. So while you start your life as omnipotent, an omnipotent being, gradually you learn that there are limits to your power. As you start your life as an omniscient being, know, knowing all and so on, you gradually learn that there's a limit to your knowledge. And narcissists do not learn this. Narcissists remain stuck at age six or age nine. They remain stuck with a form of narcissism known as secondary narcissism, as opposed to primary narcissism. It is the narcissism of childhood writ large. And so we have a whole spectrum. On the healthier, on the healthier pole, we have people with healthy narcissism who outgrew the more delusional aspects and fantastic aspects and grandiose aspects of the narcissism and remained holding the core of self-confidence, self-esteem, and self-stable sense of self-worth. That is the healthy pole. And then we have a whole spectrum of degrees of less and less and less healthy narcissism. So Theodore Millen, one of the fathers of the modern study of personality disorders, suggested that we should make a distinction between narcissistic disorders, which is really an extreme and severe form of narcissism, and narcissistic style, and between narcissistic style and narcissistic personality. He said, we can have people who have a narcissistic style of behavior, but they are not narcissists. Or we can have people who have a narcissistic personality but they are not, for instance, delusional. 
they are not grandiose, they have empathy, and so on and so forth. They are a bit self-centered, they are a bit egocentric, they are a bit, um, you know, they, they overlook the needs and preferences and desires and wishes of others, they are socially awkward, perhaps, and so on. So he said that there, there is a whole continuum of narcissistic behaviors, traits, styles, personalities, between the healthy person and the really, really deranged and depraved narcissist, which is also known as malignant narcissist. Let's talk about the varieties of narcissists. Let's start with the most basic, the classic versus the compensatory narcissist. The classic narcissist is a narcissist who usually have been raised, has been raised by parents who idolized him, pampered, doted upon him, smothered him with love, but also with expectations. So this kind of narcissist grew up to believe that he is the extension of his parents, the tool to realize for realizing their unfulfilled dreams. That his role in life is to abide by their wishes and gratify them one way or the other. So the love this kind of narcissist has received is conditional, and he had become, during his upbringing, a tool, an instrument of his parents. His boundaries have been, have not been, he, he was not allowed to develop boundaries. And, he, and, and if he did develop them, they had been breached. So this is the kind of narcissist that carries through life, believing himself to be superior, feeling very entitled to special treatment and special accomplishments without any commensurate investment or, or effort, and gets very pissed off when things don't happen his way, even if he is a lazy bum. So this is the classic narcissist. This kind of narcissist is very grandiose, very imposing, overwinning, very demanding, very entitled, rages very frequently. He's a brat. He pouts, he, you know, he's spoiled. Spoiled brat. This is the classic narcissist. As opposed to the classic narcissist, we have a more prevalent type known as compensatory narcissist. Compensatory narcissist is a narcissist whose upbringing consisted of abuse in a variety of forms. And this abuse forced the narcissist as a child to develop an alternative personality called the false self. This false self served as a decoy. It is the false self who confronted his abusers, the child's abusers. It's the false self who suffered the pain. The false self who deflected the pain. The false self was everything the, the child could not be. False self was all-knowing, all-powerful, Superman type, you know? So we say that the false self, the construct of the false self in early childhood was meant to compensate for the child's inadequacies, helplessness, and impotence in the face of prolonged abuse. This compensatory tendency remains with this kind of narcissist throughout his life. Deep inside, the compensatory narcissist feels that he is worthless, that he is a bad object, that he is uh, a failure, that he is ugly, that he is stupid, and so on and so forth. And to compensate for that, he projects a false self that is overconfident, grandiose, fantastic, inflated, demanding, and so on. So this is the compensatory narcissist. Another very important distinction is between classic narcissists and covert narcissists. And the difference between them is a bit like the difference between extrovert and introvert. The covert narcissist is a narcissist who lacks self-confidence, <laughs> which is, sounds a bit uh, like an, an oxymoron, contradiction in terms, but it happens. It's a narcissist who is shy, who is fragile, who is avoidant, who is a bit schizoid. Narcissists who would rather act through, an, through another person, would rather remain behind the scenes, a bit passive-aggressive, manipulative, scheming, and yet, deep inside, convinced of his own superiority, of his own grandiosity, of his own perfection and brilliance, and so on. So this narcissist is actually a full-fledged, the covert narcissist is actually a full-fledged narcissist. Only he doesn't dare to speak his name. This is the kind of narcissist that doesn't dare to pursue his fantasies and his dreams of everlasting dominion, of money, of sex, of power, of uh, fame, 
he doesn't dare to pursue these dreams. And this inability to pursue his dreams and to realize his fantasies renders him very frustrated, very aggressive, um, and very, very pernicious. It's a very insidious type of narcissist. Now, there is a sub-variant of this, of the covert narcissist, known as inverted narcissist. Inverted narcissist is a covert narcissist. In other words, a narcissist who avoids the limelight, who avoids exposure to other people, who is shy, who is reticent, who is, is homeward, homebound. But this kind of narcissist, the inverted narcissist, realizes her dreams and aspirations and grandiose wishes and fantasies through her partner, through her spouse, through her mate, through her colleague, through her children. They will go out to the world they accomplish things, and by being associated with them, her grandiosity is supported. So if she's the wife of the President of the United States, then she can feel grandiose enough because she's the First Lady. If she's the wife of a rich guy, then she, she feels that her fantasies have been fulfilled through him. It is a kind of narcissist by proxy. Now, inverted narcissists team up exclusively with narcissists. They team up with narcissists because only narcissists can bring home narcissistic supply for the inverted narcissist to consume. And so we call inverted narcissists co-narcissists or codependent narcissists. The last important distinction, I think, although there are many more, but these are the critical ones. The last important distinction is between cerebral and somatic narcissists. Narcissists use their personal traits, qualities, and skills in order to garner narcissistic supply. So if I'm intelligent, I will show off my intelligence. I will show off my intellect. I will brag about my achievements in class, university. I write a book. And I will leverage these accomplishments to garner, to get from you, narcissistic supply. And this kind of narcissist is called cerebral narcissist. It's a narcissist who uses his mind, his intellect, his intelligence in order to obtain narcissistic supply from the environment, attention, adulation, admiration, and so on. And then there is a second type, the somatic narcissist. That is a narcissist who is not very endowed in the upper compartment. He is not the most brilliant star in the bright star in the galaxy. So he is not capable of writing amazing books or showing pyrotechnics of intelligence and intellect. He doesn't have it. He doesn't have what it takes. But he has a great body. So this kind of narcissist is going to use his body as a tool to obtain narcissistic supply. He is going to body build. He's going to become a sex fiend, a sexual conqueror. He's going to, to have numerous sexual conquests. He is going to become a marathon runner. He's going to use his body to obtain adulation, admiration, supply, attention, and so on. This kind of narcissist we call somatic narcissist. So as you see, narcissism is a very, very hyper-complex phenomenon. We can have totally opposite types within the same psychodynamic category. For example, we can have a shy narcissist with a very outgoing narcissist. We can have a stupid narcissist, the somatic narcissist, usually, as I said, not well endowed intellectually, uh, as against a genius. We can have someone who feels that he owns the world and he is far superior to anything, the next stage in evolution, as opposed to someone who, who believes himself to be trash, zero, nothing, inadequate. And all of them, put together, all of them are in the same category. They are all narcissists. There are many ways, and they all lead to narcissism. Narcissism, adaptative mechanism. It is a way of coping with the cruel, hostile, abusive world. It's a way of coping with lack of unconditional love. It's a way of coping with very, very cold environments. And each one of us comes to the world with his own toolkit. So we use whatever toolkit we've been given to develop our narcissism in our own idiosyncratic and highly specific way. There are, of course, common traits common to all narcissists, but the manifestations vary very widely. If you were to identify the key trait of narcissism, would that be specifically a lack of empathy. Furthermore, when you use the word empathy, how is that strictly defined? No one knows. That's the long and the short of it. We very often, including in science, and especially in the so-called social sciences, which, whether they are sciences or not, is still open to very, very serious debate. 
But in social sciences, we very often use words, the definition of which eludes us even as we use them. Empathy is a very bad translation, the German word Einfühlung, or feeling the same. And it means essentially feeling as another person does. But then it immediately opens the que a question known in philosophy as intersubjectivity. How can I verify that I feel what you feel? I have no access to your mind, ever, by definition. I have to rely on your reports, verbal reports, body language reports. It's all a form of communication. I have to rely on communication in order to compare my inner experiences with your inner experiences. But that doesn't mean that we are talking about the same thing. When you say pain and I say pain, when you say love and I say love, are we talking about the same thing? There is no way on earth to determine this. We therefore rely on conventions, conventions that are open, open to serious philosophical challenge. But let's leave philosophy aside. Empathy in the operational sense is the ability to have an emotional reaction which ostensibly arises in the other person under similar circumstances. In other words, it's a kind of transference, it's a kind of transfer of emotion from one person to another via visual or other input. So you see someone stubbing his toe, that's the visual input, and it provokes in you, evokes in you, a kind of emotional response which you assume is identical to the emotional response in the person who just who had just stubbed his toe. Notice how many assumptions and hyper assumptions there are. Okay, now empathy very often is described as a monolithic quantity. It is definitely not monolithic. It has many many layers developed over life, and I think it has at least three layers. The first one is, is what I call the uh, reflexive instinctual layer. Reflexive instinctual layer is the kind of empathy that babies have. When a baby sees his mother, watches his mother, the baby's face change, facial expressions of the baby change to reflect the mother's mood. You're a mother, probably know that. Yes. When you are sad or when you're smiling, the baby smiles. When you're sad, the baby frowns. It's Babies react to, to the mother's mood, especially the mother, by the way. They react very strong. And this, this requires empathy. The baby is required to decipher and decode your mood prior to reacting. So this decoding is nonverbal. It's not even intellectual because the baby's brain is insufficiently developed at this stage. I'm talking about six months, six months old. It must be some kind of reflex or instinct. Yet, it has all the, all the hallmarks of empathy and it continues well into adult life. Even as adults, our facial expressions change when we witness pain, laughter, sadness, or happiness. Exactly as though we were still babies. So this is the first layer. The second layer of empathy is emotional empathy. Emotional empathy develops after instinctual and reflexive empathy and probably as its foundation. Emotional empathy is simply the ability to feel, to emote in response to some information regarding another person's predicament or situation or state of mind. We react not only with our faces or with our body, as babies do, we now react with emotions. We see someone in pain, we wince, we feel almost pain. We see someone unhappy, we may cry, weep with them. We see, you know, it's kind of sympathy, not only empathy, but there is an element of sympathy. And there is definitely a recognizable, identifiable, emotional response in the viewer. And this is emotional empathy. And then the last layer is cognitive empathy. Cognitive empathy is the ability to observe a series of, uh, a series of data and then arrange them or frame them so that they yield information about the other person. So if I see someone 
stubbing his toe. I see that his face is contorting. I would put two and two together, toe being stubbed, face contorted, and I would say he's in pain. That is kind of cognitive empathy. Cognitive empathy has no emotional elements. It is sort of an analytic software. The ability to observe other people and make deductions based on our inner world as to their inner world. Ever since 1997, I've been saying that it is wrong to say that narcissists and psychopaths do not have empathy. I do not think that is true. And I came up with a suggested uh, phrase. I said that narcissists and psychopaths have cold empathy as opposed to warm empathy. Warm empathy is what, we, what all healthy people have. Warm empathy is cognition, emotion, and instinct and reflex, all mixed together, all in perfect harmony, all provoked unintentionally, all automatic. And this is healthy empathy. Cold empathy, as opposed to warm empathy, doesn't have the emotional element. It is only cognitive. Cold empathy is the ability to read other people, to analyze them, to penetrate their mind, to see what's happening inside their heads, to understand their emotions, including pain and fear, and then to make note of all these things in a huge database and to leverage and use this new information to benefit from it. Narcissists use this information to obtain narcissistic supply, to manipulate the other person so as to yield supply. Psychopaths use this information to obtain material favors, sex, money, power. So, but both narcissists and psychopaths do empathize with other people in the sense that they know what it means to be another human being. They can put themselves in someone else's shoes. And then once they put themselves, so once I as a narcissist put myself in your shoes, once I understand what it means to be you, once I will find out, once, once I find out, find out your weak points, your vulnerabilities, the chinks in your armor, what makes you tick, your thoughts, your hopes, your preferences, your wishes, your dreams. Once I have all this enormous database about you, I will then use it to force you to give me narcissistic supply. I will use it to manipulate you. And if I'm a psychopath, I will use it to take your money or, you know, obtain some other benefit from you. So do you think it's the case that a narcissist does that um, most of the time, unconsciously or consciously? In other words, it's kind of, it's interesting to me that a narcissist wants narcissistic supply, which, which means some object which gives him a certain set of emotions whether it's a feeling of success a feeling of warmth food whatever sex whatever the gig is he wants that very badly and um he has this cold em empathy which probably he's had since childhood and which he probably doesn't realize for many years is not necessarily the same kind of transfer of emotion actual emotional input um do you think that he, to a significant degree, the narcissist unconsciously is using cold empathy to get what he wants from other people because he doesn't get the same kind of feedback the rest of us do from, doesn't ha there's no way for him to get warm empathy, which is a tremendous p value to a lot of people, right? If, if I'm, a, a if I get a lot of pleasure from my, from my children's satisfaction and happiness or I get a lot of pleasure from my husband's um satisfaction and happiness like it, it, having them be happy makes me happy it, I I get that feedback so they don't have to do things for me you know what I'm saying because be, seeing them happy actually does make me happy because I get that sort of contact high but that's I think that's genetic do you know what I'm saying or it's somehow rather it that's built into me that that response and I wonder if not get, having that response kind of ultimately forces narcissists to become fairly manipulative because they have to kind of get people to do what they what they want them to do and they don't respond the way other people do right i don't well, know if that no was clear <laughs> i hope so I mean, i'm still, <laughs> still trying <laughs> um 
no one no one knows whether empathy is acquired or learned or whether empathy is inbred or whether empathy is uh, you know it's still it's still very very unclear there are studies that indicate that you can learn empathy even late in life and there are studies that indicate exactly the opposite that if you hadn't acquired empathy till age 6 it's a lost cause so no one knows the answer to this one however it is true that narcissism is a is an adaptive adaptive reaction to the environment people say why do narcissists find it so difficult to get rid of their narcissism why don't they want to heal why don't they want to be better why don't they want to be different well they don't want to heal if healing is the word they don't want to be better they want to be different because narcissism works it's an adaptive reaction it works narcissism works for them and it had been it has been working for them since age 6 or 4 or 3 or 6 months in an environment the narcissist grows in narcissism is actually pathological narcissism is actually a healthy reaction it is the environment that is pathological it is the environment that is sick the, the child reacts to a sick dysfunctional pathological environment by developing a sick dysfunctional pathological mechanism of coping with this environment but the mechanism works it's adaptive it yields results it guarantees the child's survival and growth it allows the child to derive outcomes and benefits from his environment so the child learns gradually that narcissism is not such a bad thing and of course when you are 40 years old or 50 years old it's too late for you to learn new tricks you know most narcissists are one one trick dogs or ponies they throughout their lives they found out that narcissism <clears throat> is sufficiently productive sufficiently constructive and sufficiently yielding for them not to bother to begin to adopt new coping mechanisms and strategies so the answer to your question is that narcissists are emotionally invested in their narcissism perhaps it's the only thing they are emotionally invested in and narcissism is about the constant maintenance of an alternative reality Pathological narcissism is the first documented case of virtual reality and alien intelligence. Long before anyone was talking about virtual reality in IT, information technology, and long before anyone raised the thought of aliens, there were narcissists and they felt like aliens on this earth and they were they lived in a kind of virtual reality. Now narcissism is the constant investment, constant maintenance, huge effort and attempt, energy consuming, energy depleting, gigantic work to maintain an alternative reality. And in this alternative reality, the narcissist is everything that he is not in real reality. And this is what we call the false self. It's another version of the narcissist, an avatar, another representation in a kind of multiplayer game where the narcissist is everything perfect brilliant and so on now it's very easy to get emotionally attached to being perfect and brilliant and strong and powerful and sexy and irresistible it's very very easy to get attached to such a self image emotionally attached it's very very difficult to get you to divorce this self image in favor of what in favor of a shabby reality drab routine life and so on so it is an escape escape valve coping mechanism a workable strategy an adaptive manifestation you name it narcissism works for the narcissist narcissism demands only one thing to obtain narcissistic supply it's an addiction it's an addictive behavior 
it demands narcissistic supply. Now, unfortunately for the narcissist, narcissistic supply has to come from other people. It cannot come from television sets or from refrigerators. It has to come from other people. It forces the narcissist to exit his virtual reality, to exit this alternate universe, to enter, re-enter our world, to interact with other people in a way that will force them to acknowledge that the alternative reality is reality and that their own reality should be denied. In other words, it's a cult. Narcissists create cults and they are all cult leaders. Sometimes there is only one member in the cult of the narcissist, his wife, long-suffering wife. Sometimes five members, his wife and his three children. Sometimes 50 members, his co-workers and employees. Sometimes it's a whole nation, like in Nazi Germany. But whatever it is, and however numerous the membership of the cult, the narcissist has to create an environment, which I call the pathological narcissistic space, where a group of people will share with him his delusion, will agree with him that his alternative reality is not of confabulation, is not fake, is not a storyline, is not a narrative, but is real. Will keep telling him, yes, you are brilliant. Yes, you are perfect. Yes, you are Mr. Wonderful, you know? No, you are not mistaken. No, you're not delusional. No, you're not crazy. It's all true. And we call this phenomenon when dozens of people or other people participate in your own delusion and support it, we call it shared psychosis. Narcissism is about creating mass delusions. When other people tell you, keep telling you that you're okay, you're not crazy, you are really perfect and brilliant. You are really godlike. They are giving you narcissistic supply. The currency, the coin of the cult, the coin of this alternate reality is narcissistic supply. To be a member of the cult of the narcissist, you have to pay the narcissist with narcissistic supply. Now, the narcissist is not interested in you. He is interested in your narcissistic supply. So there is no question of interpersonal relationship, intimacy, awareness of the other, uh, accommodation, collaboration, compassion, empathy. All these things are incidental to narcissistic supply if they exist at all. Usually they don't. None of these things yields or brings about narcissistic supply. None of them. So why waste energy on them? The narcissist has a very, very strenuous, strenuous energy economy. He needs all his energy to maintain this edifice, this house of cards of narcissistic delusion, grandiose fantasy. He needs all everything in his power, day and night, waking hours and sleep. Everything he needs to dedicate to maintaining this precarious balance this house of cards he doesn't have time or energy for anything else he doesn't have time or energy to love someone to care for someone to collaborate with someone to empathize with someone there's no time and no energy for that he is a junkie if you ever came across junkies they behave exactly the same so one of the things that you've talked about I'm conscious of the fact that, um, <laughs> like, we've been talking for an hour, and I could listen for, listen and talk for threes, but I don't want to. I'm happy to take no, up all not, your time. You're not, impo you're not uh, Nancy. You're not imposing on me. All right, thank so, you. So it's okay. Go so on. if um, yeah. it sounds like a very laborious lifestyle, in the sense that the narcissist spends a lot of time creating narcissistic supply in order to feel safe and secure and to some degree to create the environment that he grew up in or try to create some sort of safety for himself and he's always kind of tap dancing trying to appease the emotions when he's to the extent that he absolutely has to in order to get them to give what he needs to get from them but at some point I can see why this house of cards kind of falls down and when that happens and there is no narcissistic supply 
you've mentioned that there's kind of sometimes, rarely, very rare occasions, a window when a narcissist can realize that they've got a problem that they need to actually seek help for. So can you sort of talk about what happens when the narcissistic supply economy collapses and narcissist, like what happens to his personality during that time period? Well, it's, it's rather simple, actually. For the false self, which is the narcissist facade, the message that he is sending to the world, the, the spin, the spin doctoring of the narcissist's life and, and identity. The false self, which is a concoction, it's a scenario, a script, it's a, a piece of, it's a narrative, it's a story, it's a confabulation, piece of fiction. So the false self requires, narciss requires narcissistic supply. It's a little like having uh, a car. You know, you need to put fuel. You need to put fuel in the car. If you don't put fuel in the car, you will still have the car, but it won't take you places. It won't be functional. Without fuel, the false self stops being functional, ceases to function. And so when the false self, self ceases to function, normally the narcissist is exposed to messages from the environment, messages from reality, which contravene his grandiose perception, which contrast with his fantasy about himself, which undermine the narrative of his life and of who he is, which challenge his totally fictitious and delusional identity, and which render him less than able to cope with what I call the grandiosity gap. Grandiosity gap is the gap between reality and totally fantastic self-image. So thus exposed, without an immune system, it's actually a line of defense, without an immune system, the narcissist becomes very, very vulnerable. Actually, what happens then, he becomes, again, the child that he used to be. The years fall away from the narcissist like so much shedded skin. And suddenly, cowering in the corner, mumbling, crying his eyes off, frightened, sniveling, is this little kid who had developed the false self in the first place as a defense mechanism as a mystic shield, as a magical sword, you know. The magic is gone, and here's the kid. It's a child, six years old, nine at the most, and he is terrified, and he doesn't know what to do because nothing is working anymore to shield him from the arrows, arrows of life, from the pain and the hurt and the, and the, and the fear and the challenges and the abuse and so on. At that point, narcissists, look for help. So they may seek therapy or they may, be, may really connect finally, intimately with their loved ones, the ones who love them. Yeah? Mm -hmm. <laughs> or they may seek meaningful relationships with parents or they, they, they cast around for someone, they're drowning. They cast around for a straw for someone to hand them, give them a hand. And so, it is then that the narcissist usually ends up in therapy. But in therapy, the narcissist doesn't seek, usually, doesn't seek to understand himself, what brought him to this, and how to avoid it next time. The narcissist seeks not to heal or to change, but the narcissist usually seeks in therapy to restore the false self. He wants things to be as they used to be. He comes to the therapist and he complains, my wife left me, can you bring her back to me? Or, I, I used to be so famous, can you teach me a few tricks to be famous again? He wants the therapist to collaborate with him, to teach him tricks and gimmicks, how to restore his grandiose false self to full functioning mode, how to extract narcissistic supply yet again. Extremely few narcissists, if any, come to therapy and say, I've realized that something is fundamentally and profoundly wrong with me. Can you help me? I'm not aware of a single one, myself included. You, and, say, you say no. that, but if you think, I think it's clear that you're self-aware. Uh -huh. uh, you're self-aware of the fact that you have a personality disorder and you're accommodating it as best you can. 
I mean, I, I guess my point is, if you really can't feel, if you really can't feel instinctual sympathy, and that can't be manufactured, I don't really know if you can get the same buzz the rest of us do off of interpersonal relationships. Do you know what I'm saying? It's like saying, I don't, I don't, it's, if, if the only sympathy that you can manufacture, that you can present to the world is cold sympathy or manufactured behavior based upon cold sympathy because you don't feel real sympathy then and that's what the rest of us are doing using to be so effortless in our human interactions i don't really see the path to healing is not is not at your command does that make sense i i'm not i'm, I'm not, not making sure excuses i'm trying to say it's like i don't i don't know if if it is an organic illness or if it's a, a kind of damage that's done early enough that it actually changes the shape of the brain or some aspect of the brain and you can't feel that other empathy that we feel that we use to get by from day to day and to get the buzz we get when other people are happy, I don't know how easy that is to fix. So maybe the only thing you can do is go back to what you had before or try to. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. Indeed, the, the emphasis in most treatment modalities, including the most modern treatment modalities such as cognitive behavioral therapy or emotive cognitive behavioral therapy or, you know, the most schema, schema therapy and you name it. Uh, the vast majority of these treatment modalities um, are very modest about the treatment, the treatment goals and about the therapeutic alliance. Uh, most of them seek to modify behaviors. That most when when narcissists present in a therapeutic setting, when they first encounter the therapist for the first time, usually the goals would be to modify the narcissist's socially unacceptable, antisocial, and abrasive behaviors. I don't know of any serious therapist who would claim that he can cure narcissism or heal narcissism. Those who do are charlatans. Money grabbing, money grabbing, money hungry charlatans. Serious, serious uh, therapists would admit that, yes, as you just said, the core of narcissism, the kernel of narcissism, is beyond reach. Whether it is because of brain plasticity, whether it's because of genetic component, possibly, no one knows. But narcissism. As an all-pervasive, these are the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual's words, not mine. Narcissism is an all-pervasive personality disorder, where no cell is left unaffected, is not amenable to treatment, to cure, or to healing, or to reversal in any meaningful way. However, it is very possible, and is done thousands of times a year, you know, it's very possible to modify the behaviors of the narcissist so that his interactions with the environment are more palatable, more acceptable, more pleasant, less abrasive, less, fr less fraught with friction and conflict. Narcissists have been, behaviors of narcissists have been modified to the extent that people, you know, found them livable with. <laughs> uh, marriages have been restored, you know, into other relationships have been, you know, companies have been firms have been revived. So Nazis, Nazis doesn't have to go through life in a state of constant conflict and tribulation. Beha narcissistic behavior can be modified to the extent that it becomes socially recognizable and socially acceptable. However, it does not touch by a millimeter the core and kernel of Nazis. You mentioned brain plasticity, there is no doubt. The years of abuse and then decades of specific behaviors, set behaviors, modify brain neural pathways, uh, pathways and, and so on. Brain is very plastic. And there is also no doubt in my mind, although this has not been substantiated by any studies, uh, extended st extensive studies, there's also no doubt in my mind that pathological narcissism is a genetic propensity. Because we see many, we see families in which Five children have been subjected to exactly the same treatment, and yet only one of them becomes a narcissist. The others don't. Why? Why, peop why children, including, by the way, twins and triplets, where two, two members of a twin or two twins or triplets 
have been subjected to identical abuse, including the most horrific sexual abuse and so on, and yet only one of them becomes a narcissist. Why? I think it is a genetic propensity. So genetic propensity plus brain plasticity could be a very powerful combination and in all probability irreversible. But the goal of uh, therapy should not be human engineering, should not be reinventing the narcissist as a totally different human being. That is very sinister. The goal of therapy is, is to render the narcissist more functional in his relationships, in his environment, to allow him to go through life in a manner that will not leave him, will not wreck him, will not ruin him, will not render him a bitter, old, frustrated, lonely uh, wreck of a human being. That's, that's, I think, what therapy should be, should be all about, and not only in the case of narcissism. One of the reasons I like your website better than I like most of um, or the vast majority, or let's say all the others, um, is that because you do take a very psychodynamic approach and because you do spend a lot of time um, documenting sort of the interior thinking and the trigger mechanisms, um, you have a better insight into, I think, than most people into what therapeutic methods might conceivably work. So if somebody were a narcissist or thought they were a narcissist or, you know, was cowering in their home realizing that they've driven off every single person they ever really liked, is there, and with the understanding that it, they could have an entirely different uh, ailment ranging from post-traumatic stress disorder, which might present some of the same symptoms or whatever, how would you tell them to seek someone to treat them? Because getting the wrong therapist would be pretty toxic. Like, what would you tell them to look for? Well, first of all, as an aside, narcissism is precise, precisely a post-traumatic syndrome. Narcissists have been traumatized as children, one way or the other, by being smothered and pampered and spoiled, or by being abused in a classical way sense. So, uh, whichever way, narcissists have been traumatized, and narcissism is really a post-traumatic reaction. That's as an aside. Now, unfortunately, the so-called scholars, professionals, and experts today are 20 years behind the curve. Um, there is a shocking arrogance among these people. Um, they do not seek to learn. Many of them, for instance, as a matter of principle, refuse to visit forums of, narcissi of victims of narcissistic abuse mm. because there's nothing to learn there, you know? Mm -hmm. The biggest studies of narcissists that I came across were comprised of 30 subjects, three zero. The vast majority of studies of narcissists were comprised of five, four to five to six people. Based on these ridiculous non-representative samples, the academic profession pretends to knowledge. And yet, they are so retarded in their thinking, so way behind the curve, so way behind the curve, even when compared to the 1970s, to works to the works of Kohut and Kernberg, or to the 1980s, to the works of Masterson and so on. There's been a regression, not progress, but regression. It's interesting. The state of it, you sh it's interesting you should mention that because my daughter's studying psychology at um, Cal at the uh, University of Santa Cruz, and she studied with one of the last um, professors who studied under Jung. And on his last day, he was blind, going deaf, and had just found out he had a terminal illness. He said, wow. "Some of you in this class have to study cognitive science." You the whole industry is moving toward drugs as a solution for the treatment of underlying personality disorders, and they've left behind um, the entire the entire universe of other psychotherapeutic methods. And it is the case that you can't treat every mental illness through drugs at this time, and it's unlikely to be the case that you'll ever be able to use it as the sole method for treating mental illness. And if none of you engage in 
the kind of work, and he mentioned the pe some of the people that you talked about, he says, if you don't kick up where they left off, we're going to fall into another dark age. And he seemed to think we already had. I fully agree with him. I fully agree with him because I compare texts, scholarly texts, released today, to scholarly texts released in the 70s and 80s, to scholarly texts released in the 10s, 20s, and 30s of the last century. And I see a constant regression. Regression, not progress. The state of knowledge about pathological narcissism today is far inferior to the state of knowledge about pathological narcissism in the 70s. Far inferior. When we had wonderful practitioners like Karen Hornay, Kohut, later Kernberg, and so on. Millen, Millen, Theodore Millen operated in, in the last two decades of the previous century. You know, it's getting worse and worse, not better and better. And, and simultaneously, there is a growing arrogance. Uh, I just mentioned the fact that most therapists and scholars I interact with adamantly refuse to visit online forums where tens of thousands of people, sometimes hundreds of thousands of people, compare invaluable experiences with people diagnosed officially as narcissists. I mean, it's mind-boggling. Mind-boggling. This arrogance reflects the fact, in my view, that the, uh, the professions of therapy, psychotherapy, I mean, psychological professions, let's call them, including psychiatry or maybe especially psychiatry, but also classical psychology, abnormal psychology, and so on and so forth, and even among therapists. I think there's an over-representation of narcissists. I think narcissists gravitate towards certain professions. Mm -hmm. I think we're far more likely to find narcissists, for instance, in show business, in, uh, in the media, in the mass media, among people who wield power, like police or judiciary, among the clergy, and so on and so forth. We are also very likely to find an over-representation of malignant pathological narcissists among therapists, psychiatrists, and psychologists, with emphasis on psychiatrists. I think there is resistance in classical Freudian terms. There is a kind of resistance in the profession well, I would say for, uh, for self-scrutiny. I think you're right, and I, but I think what's interesting, or what's probably most, um, there's a couple of things that are interesting to me about that. The first one is that the traditional wisdom, if you go on the vast majority, if you, vast majority of textbooks, mass, vast majority of works written about narcissist and narcissistic personality disorder, the advice is avoid them and they are, the advice is that they uh, should be avoided at all costs and that they are evil, <laughs> which is a pretty, like what else, like you don't say that about autistic people and you don't say it about borderline people, but if you're a narcissist or somebody decides you are, too bad for you. The other thing is they don't necessarily, um, given the number or the percentage of people who um, suffer from the ailment who are reportedly doing inflicting large quantities of abuse or damage on large quantities of people, you'd think the need to treat narcissists would be higher, not lower, right? In other words, if you want to, if you want to make the world a more peaceful place, then uh, finding an effective treatment for narcissism would seem like a big step in the right direction. And yet it's not so like that's there's why a... Saying, that's why I'm, think, I'm saying that I think there is a form of resistance among the, among the therapeutic professions because of over-representation of narcissists. I think they are, they are avoiding self-scrutiny. They are avoiding looking in the mirror. And uh, this is a learned guess, not a guess, but a learned guess. I, I am collaborating with close to 1,000 therapists, and I have come across thousands of them. And I regret to say that a sizable chunk of them struck me. I, I couldn't remote diagnose them, of course, nor am I qualified to diagnose, but they struck me as narcissists. I think it's very prevalent among these professions, and uh, it's a problem. They can easily study borderline, because most of them are not. They can easily study even psychopaths, because most of them are not. They can study any other mental illness, schizophrenia. But suddenly, when it comes to narcissism, there is this blockage. There is this resistance. There is this inability to move forward. Listen, narcissism has become a 
buzzword, a household, a household word, a catchphrase, at least since 2004, at least. I have contributed my share to rendering it so, but there were others, of course. Between 2004 and now, there, there's a, you know, it's an avalanche. And yet, you can't really see any concerted effort. For example, I'll give you an example. There is a concerted effort to study the brains of psychopaths. Concerted effort in dozens of locations throughout the world using the latest functional magnetic resonance, you know, fMRI, using the latest genetic markers, huge budgets, investments, and what have you, to study psychopaths. There is a huge investment in studying bipolar disorder. There is enormous investment in studying autism, borderline personality disorder, and so on. The only field where I personally am not aware of any budgets, any coordinated research effort, done anywhere. And believe me, if there would have been, if there was something like that, I would have known about it. So the only, only diagnosis which is totally ignored and neglected by the academic profession, I mean, is narcissistic personality disorder. And yet, and yet, it is by far the most debated, discussed, and, and analyzed in, you know, in the mass media, in uh, show business, in, in uh, online, it is by far what disturbs, what bothers people most. If you were to, to stop, if you were to take a, represent, a random sample of a thousand people, I am not convinced how many of them uh, heard of schizoid personality disorder. But I can bet you that ten times more people heard about narcissism. And yet, there is a lot more going on in the study of schizoaffective disorders than in the study of narcissism. Well, Why? I think, it cannot be a coincidence. I think it's because the... Uh, things may change quickly, one never knows. But I, I think it has to do with the fact that it, the second that we're in a, a fad state where the label's been applied that if you have narcissistic personality disorder, you should... You should one, first you should be abandoned. Right. Everybody should just get away from you because you're dangerous. And then the second thing is that um, you are untreatable and will refuse treatment, which is not always the case. I mean, it's difficult, shall we say. And then all and the, the notion about brain plasticity and the fact that it may be in some sense genetic um, or due to childhood abuse indicates that, it, that um, well, it's sort of a notion of damaged goods, which, you know, if somebody is autistic... Uh, they kind of apply the same labels, but they still try to make them as functional as possible. People with nurse, narcissistic personality I, I disorder. Wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't think that uh, the, the profession regards people with schizophrenia or people with borderline as more amenable to treatment than people with narcissism. Well, I wouldn't say that. I just schizophrenia never... is a serious, serious disorder. That's so, true, but I, but, I, but, I, but the thing is that they that as you said they've developed drugs to that. Um, antipsychotics to treat it. I've never heard anybody say, you know, if you know somebody that has narcissistic personality disorder or somebody you think has, then you should, you know, this is the therapist you should see and this is the kind of treatments you should But this follow. is precisely what I'm saying. Why not? Why don't you? Why not? Why don't you hear that? I think because it Why, if you're a psychopath, they would offer you drugs and specific therapies and so on. If you're borderline, they would give you drugs and so on. I don't but know. But not if you're not. I think it has to do with the fact that it's been identified in some sense as a moral illness. It's a very strange thing, actually. I, I might, I, I'm probably more hopeful than most people because I think that um, I've seen things change that I never thought would change. You know, I've looked at... Well, my, my pet theory is that the profession is narcissistic and mm -hmm. they are afraid to look, look themselves in the mirror. That's all. I think you're, I think you're correct, but I think it also... It, it, somebody will choose to move forward on it, I think, simply because it is a very fertile field of study. And, and I suspect when that happens, <laughs> they'll be talking to you quite a bit. So I think the other, one of the, so the next thing that I sort of wanted to talk about, and thank you very much for giving me so much time. Um, and, no, no problem. Um, I, since I work here in uh, Los Angeles and I work with a lot of uh, filmmakers and writers, it's amazing to me how many stories I see about serial killers or crime kingpins or 
bad politicians, um, and I could you know, list every stereotype that's associated with narcissistic personality disorder. People are writing about it all the time, and yet uh, I find that very few people, I don't think writers a lot of times realize that they're presenting an, a very inaccurate and unsatisfying um, picture of people who hold those positions. And I think it comes from the fact that they're making up out of whole cloth. If, if a story is based on reality, you're seeing the behavior of a real person. And they're, what they present is very interesting. Whereas um, if you're manufacturing a character from whole cloth, it's pure fantasy and it has no basis in reality. So have you ever seen pictures of people with narcissistic personality disorder in the media that struck you as particularly accurate or inaccurate um, that well I'd, I'd rather I'd rather not recommend specific flicks but mm -hmm. I I will make a, a blanket uh, statement I rarely if ever came across a total misrepresentation of narcissists in in films I'm a film buff I have a library of 23,000 films so and I make it a point to watch two films a day so I suspect that I would have come across uh, misrepresentations, inaccuracies, glaring inaccuracies and so on. So I, I can't say that I've ever come across a total misrepresent, misrepresentation of narcissists and so on. But I think the problem is, if there is a problem, it's that when narcissists are described, First of all, they are not identified as narcissists. So we have serial killers, cult leaders, corrupt politicians, criminal kingpins, uh, crime pins, uh, kings, um, and so on. And uh, clergy, abusive clergy, I mean, you name it. And the, sometimes a detailed analysis of their psyche or psychology is sacrificed in favor of a detailed analysis or description of their actions. Now, this may be a plot device or a decision, um, an intentional decision. I'm not sufficiently well versed in script writing or in movie making to to uh, give advice on that front. But the the movies that did attempt to go deeper did attempt a psychological profiling of the anti-hero. Or protagonist um, did a good surface job. The problem was not so much that they got it wrong, but that they got it shallow. And then it raises the question, of course, whether viewers around the world would have liked to see something deeper and more profound and more and thereby perhaps a bit more accurate or whether shallow is the name of a game and actually that's what's selling the goods that's precisely what audiences all over the world are looking for in other words whether this is a commercial decision whereby the producer says you know don't go too deep it will turn off audiences and it's you know in our target markets people prefer it shallow or whether this is the result of ignorance and lack of acquaintance with uh, the deeper prof the profundities of the disorder and the plot twists that can be founded on these profundities in other words if you go deeper your your plot might become much more interesting being shallow forces you to sacrifice certain possibilities and certain potentials in the storyline going deeper Open, opens up whole universes of possible interactions, possible po uh, plot engines and drivers, possible developments. So the deeper you go, the more potentially, the more complex and interesting your story can be. However, to go deeper, one needs to, to be very well acquainted with the intricacies of narcissism and psychopathy. These are not, as I said, monolithic easy to recognize, easy to assimilate disorders. These are very, very complex series of interlocking and interacting mechanisms which sometimes yield contradictory
behaviors in the same person and sometimes at the same time. It's, uh, it's a, a bit unnerving, perhaps. Maybe some of the, maybe one of the reasons that people remain on the surface, script writers, for instance, remain on the surface, is that they're going too deep might unsettle and unnerve the audience. Mm -hmm. Maybe people don't want to go into that abyss. They don't want to dive or delve into these dark, hidden corners. And so, I don't know. I don't know what is the motivation of remaining on, on the surface. But I, all I can say is this. I haven't seen anything that is patently wrong. I haven't seen glaring inaccuracies. I haven't seen total misrepresentations, but I would say that the, the rule is shallow, behavior-driven description of people with pathological narcissism or psychopathy. It's a pity because it's the tip of an iceberg, and very often the iceberg is much more interesting than the tip. Mm -hmm. But why this decision to remain on surface and not to delve or dive deeper, that I don't know. I think I think you you you're correct in that it is not the a situation where they necessarily choose to they might want to know more but it's a question of not being able to find the information or also not knowing the 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 depth of the the depth of information available to them or the impact how it could manifest itself in a better in a better screenplay or a better story it is a case we're entering a much more competitive media market many more people producing and so bringing something new to the classic um to the bad priest or the or the criminal kingpin or the bad politician bringing something new to that may require them to go deeper just because that's what it's going to take in order to say something that hasn't been said for you know 4 million times before um i also had a question about um i think actors a lot of times will delve deeper into if, if, if when um, in playing Rain Man, the actor decided to live with somebody who had uh, who was um, an autistic savant for a period of time, so he got to know what the behavior was. So yeah. actors, a lot of times, I think, will go deeper than the screenwriter will in finding the character. And I guess you've already oh. said you won't mention um, portrayals that you think are particularly good, but if you if, if if I said, you know, the Hannibal Lecter from Silence of the Lamb, was he a psychopath or a narcissist or both? Would Could you tell from his portrayal? Yeah, mostly psychopath. Mostly psychopath. <laughs> Very cool. <laughs> and if I said um, Don Corleone from, the young Don Corleone from The Godfather? That would be, there is a, a subcategory known as psychopathic narcissist. Mm-hmm. I, I belong to that subcategory, by the way. I'm a psychopathic <laughs> narcissist. That means I've been diagnosed with both mm -hmm. narcissistic personality disorder and antisocial personality disorder. So I'm a psychopathic narcissist. Mm -hmm. This is a type of psychopath that also has manifest or very extensive narcissistic constructs, dynamics, traits, and behaviors. So, for example, very pronounced grandiosity. Um, most psychopaths, as I told you, uh, run-of-the-mill pedestrian psychopaths. They are not overly concerned with narcissistic supply. They don't have a particularly grandiose self-image. They are not out there trying to support this precarious house of cards of fantastic brilliance and perfection and so on. This is not what narcissists are about. Narcissists are about money, fame, power, but as utilitarian things. So you mean you mean psychopaths are about are are about money and about power. They're not yeah, about psychopaths, sorry, sorry. Psychopaths are about money, fame and so on, but they are not about money and fame in order to support um, um, money and uh, and uh, power, sorry. Yes. Let's let's reiterate. <laughs> psychopaths are about money and power and so on, but they are not about money and power in order to sustain some grandiose self-image. Money and power are not the means to an end. They are the end. With the narcissist, money and power are the means to an end. And the end is, is grandiosity. With the psychopath, money and power are the end. 
He wants money. He wants power. Not because he thinks he's so grandiose, but he, because he loves money and he loves power. Period. But we have a compounded uh, creature or character, <laughs> which is the psychopathic narcissist. It's someone who has comorbid or comorbidity. He has both disorders at the same time. And this type of person is both a psychopath in the classic sense and a narcissist in the classic sense. So the young Don Corleone would strike me as a psychopathic narcissist, someone who has both. But not so Hannibal Lecter. Hannibal Lecter had s strains of grandiosity. But if you look deeper, closer, you see that his grandiosity is reality-based. He, he says, um, he, he realizes that he is brilliant. He's really a genius. It's not a figment of his imagination. It's not a fantasy. It really is. He really is. Um, so, uh, as you see, there are gray areas between these two disorders because they're very close. They're very, they're, they're first cousins. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. So, <clears throat> if uh, I work with, at the moment, um, about, or run events, I should say, for a, about 8,200 writers, actors, um, and producers, so can I tell them that if they're interested in maybe having your comments on a script or maybe having your advice on a performance, they could reach out to you through your website? I mean, I know you have consulting rates and so forth, but is are you interested or willing to work on um, film or media advising? Yeah, sure. If they can afford my fees, why not? <laughs> of course. I, I, have, uh, I have clients. I, I provide consultancy consultations to clients. But these are mostly victims of abuse, or um, people who have who had a close brush or close call with narcissists and so on, and are recovering from the traumatic experience. So mostly, if not all. And that's actually uh, that's kind of an interesting uh, that's kind of an interesting avenue of exploration for stories and screenplays as well, and and theatrical plays as well because the, it, there is a tremendous amount of post-traumatic shock that comes from almost being <laughs> almost being killed by a serial killer <laughs> yes, yes. Clo close call i call this close call but you don't have to be killed by a serial killer mm -hmm. it's uh, any encounter with the narcissist leaves you usually with a strange aftertaste you know there was a robotics expert in uh, in uh, Japan in the 1970s. His name was Masahiro Mori. Mori coined the phrase uncanny valley. Mori said that as robots become more and more android, more and more uh, anthropoid, more and more like humans, um, we as spectators and users and of robots and so on, we would feel more and more uncomfortable. He said that when robots will come to resemble people very, very, very much, we would feel very, very, very uncomfortable. And you could stop and ask yourself, why is that? Ostensibly, when, when robots come to resemble people so much that you can't make, you can't distinguish between robots and people, you should feel very comfortable with these robots because they're like people, you know, and we have a lot of experience of being around people. Why is it that when robots become totally android, totally men-like, human, why should we feel so uncomfortable? And he has a, this long explanation of why we should feel uncomfortable and so on. So I think people have this kind of reaction, which is called the uncanny valley reaction. I think that people have this kind of reaction around narcissists and psychopaths. When they meet narcissists and psychopaths, when you look at the narcissists, you see a human being. When you look at the psychopath, you see a human being. You know, he has skin, eyes, hair, hands, walks and talks, breathes in and out. Perfect android. And yet, you feel very, very uncomfortable. Something's wrong. The parts don't fit. The operating system is kinky. Something is not working as it should. The simulation is perfect. The imitation is amazing. 
you can't put your finger on anything that's out of the way, anything that's awkward or anything that's not as it should be. And yet the overall feeling is an ease. You're ill at ease. You're uncomfortable. But that, Even, must, but that must be attractive yeah. to some people because a lot of narcissists... Exactly. Exactly, I was about to say, even in dating, in, in settings of dating, when women, some women are actually attracted to these idiosyncrasies, these eccentricities or deficiencies, even in these settings, women I've interviewed, and I've interviewed thousands by now, when I, when push, when I, when I push them to the corner, when I, when I force them to confront the first date and to analyze it bit by bit, stro strike by strike, moment by moment, and word by word, they admitted to having flashes of unease, even flashes of fear. So women who met narcissists, dated a narcissist on a first date, even if they happen to marry that narcissist later, even if they happen to form a family with that narcissist, have children with him, when they are pushed back, when they are taken back to the first date, they describe on the in the first date things that did not fit. Some things that provoke in them unease, fear, discomfort. They were taken aback by some comment, a bizarre movement, uh, invasion of private space, uh, strange question. And it passed. It was like a flash in the pen. You know, it's, it was momentary. But narcissists and psychopaths are like ill-fitted robots. They look perfect from the outside. They look perfectly human. But something's wrong in the software. <laughs> and the more you interact with them, the more you have this insight that not all the parts, the parts don't all fit well. That there is some, it's clunky. It's something, you know, not working. And this is called the uncanny valley. Maury's uncanny valley reaction. I absolutely believe that. I've met a number of our narcissists face to face, or people who I think you can't ever tell because they're not professionally diagnosed. But I've met a number of people that I had exactly that reaction to, and I'm going to hell because I actually I'm very happily married. I have three wonderful children. I mean, I met my husband when I was like 18, but when I see those people, they are. I think. I'm, they're interesting because they're humans that don't, that have something else going on. And it's, you just don't ever see it. You know, you're just like, wow, I've never seen that before. You know? Yes, precisely. And the robot, exactly. It's like this robot that I described. This, it, it looks human, 110% human. But you know damn well that it has a different software. You know very well that other processes are taking place inside him to which you can never be privy. You, you can never gain privilege access to this. They are so different. Narcissists and psychopaths are so different because they lack very crucial modules. Empathy is not a marginal fringe thing. It's not an incidental, unimportant thing, empathy. Empathy is the foundation of our ability to interact, to have interpersonal relationship, and it is the foundation, the building, the cornerstone of morality of social order, of social functioning. Empathy is not a small thing. But put that aside, narcissists and psychopaths have no access to their own emotions. Yes. Imagine. That's, that's actually another thing that's actually sh extremely shocking to me, is that having worked, having brushed up against these people at various points in my life, I mentioned that I did some work working with military folks and so forth. Having run up against these people, one of the things that's most shocking to me is they can't answer the question, are you happy? And a lot of times they can't identify what will make them happy in advance. They can't tell you, in, they can't say, if X, Y, and Z happen in two months, I will be happy. It's like every day is a new day. <laughs> <laughs> they have no access to their emotion. And yes, every day is a new day. I have, um, I have um, an essay that I've written. It's, it's called the, Con the Discontinuous Narcissist. Exactly. There is no, so there are no emotions, no empathy, and no personal continuity. So in effect, there's no identity. These are not marginal things. These are not things that are like having an arm amputated. You know, these are not 
these are such substantial deficiencies that they render narcissists and psychopaths, in my humble opinion, non-human. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't think, I don't think that an animal, which we all are, without empathy, without emotions, and without personal continuity, in other words, identity, can, under any stretch of the word, be called human. Well, I, I think what's interesting is that so somebody who's got this this discontinuous, and you've talked about the fact that there's a relationship between disassociative um, identity disorder and narcissism, and I've seen this as well. Like, it, it, so a narcissist, a narcissist is going through life. X something happens, triggers narcissistic problem, uh, narcissistic rage, or some sort of issue, and then subsequently, you go look. You'd say, look back at this moment leading up to this. They can't like their brain doesn't they they confabulate because they honest to God can't remember. So they can't tell you. They have no fucking idea what happened. They can't tell you what happened. If you and if you take them back to that st string of string of conversations, they go back into the narcissistic rage because they they can't remember. And it, it's very disturbing to them as well. They know that there's something that happened. They know that they've stepped outside the lines and that they've exposed they, it's like, it's very upsetting to them. I mean, I, I feel bad because it's very upsetting to them, you know, and it's like, there's no way to sue that soothing a narcissist is like a really difficult activity. So you don't really know what to do except wait for it to pass. <laughs> it's like, okay, well, <laughs> I guess I'll just step away yes. while this goes on. <laughs> you know, the same reaction. you would obtain the same reaction from people with dissociative identity disorder. Dissociative identity disorder is the modern term for multiple personality disorder. We don't use the politically incorrect term multiple personality disorder, so we use dissociative identity disorder. So you would have the same reaction exactly. If you push someone with a dissociative identity disorder to, to describe what happened on this and this date or on this and this event, they would go berserk on you. They would go postal. They would rage. So narcissists have many, many dissociative symptoms. And if you stop to think of it, about it for a, minute, for a minute, makes sense. Mm -hmm. When you have two personalities, false self and true self, I think by definition, you have multiple personalities. Mm -hmm. The false self is not um, something uh, external. It's not cosmetics. It is the narcissist. Mm -hmm. It's what we call, it's what we call co-extensive. In other words, it is all pervasive. It is the identity of the narcissist. It's not that the narcissist feels that he is acting. The false self is not the outcome of acting. It's not a manifestation of thespian skill. The narcissist, when he is in the mode of false self, is the false self. And then when the false self stops functioning, when the narcissist hits its rock bottom, then a totally new personality emerges. Totally new personality. I have clients where the husband used to be cold, indifferent, asexual, and so on and so forth. Then he hit rock bottom, and he suddenly became hypersexual, warm, intimate, clinging. He hated pets. Suddenly he, he has pets. I mean, it's like a totally different person. Well, I've, I, I'm one of the things that... Um so I spent a, I've worked in, I've worked with a lot of different people, and one of the conversations I've had is because I feel this internally is I'm very aware that I've got multiple personalities at work. I mean, every I've gone through I've had people in my family die, and I've been in the hospital. You know, so I've gone through the the feeling of disassociation, which is a rather cool feeling when it's actually happening because you'll be in a moment of crisis, and then all of a sudden you're like you feel emotionally. You, somehow inside you take a step back and everything becomes clinical and slightly funny, you know, because your brain's just like, ah, fuck it. <laughs> I'm not going to deal. Your emotions literally disengage because they're just like, I can't think straight if this shit's going on. So I, I felt that, that sense of separation and I have, and one part of my mind says, well, that's nice. And the se thank God that's over. And the second part of my mind thinks, man, I'm going to pay for this later because it does come crashing back down. And I think what happens with, I wonder if with narcissists, it's the case that they disassociated early and they, they never, the, so like, 
because of post-traumatic stress, they did separate early and it separated so continuously and so often, you just ended up with sort of these multiple personalities that are very separate from one another. I mean, we all know people who have moods and you, we've known people when they go into this mood, just leave them the fuck alone. That's normal. That's people that sort of theoretically have a normal psyche. And I think if you're dealing with somebody that has got gone through the trauma required to produce or have the genetic background required to produce narcissistic personality disorder, maybe it's the case that their personalities really are very separate and they're kind of sharing the same body and they get one they 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 overlap and they they sort of fade in and and fade out based on which is going to be more adaptive at a given time until until nothing's adaptive and then they don't know what the hell to do. In narcissistically 99.9% of life is spent with the false self. Mm-hmm. The true self is, you know, such a rare occurrence that actually the true self feels alien, mm-hmm. not, not the false self. The false self feels pretty natural. It is the true self that surprises the narcissist, unsettles him, feels alien, and uh, many narcissists resent the emergence of their true self. They... They feel that they are, you know, feel touchy and they feel weak and they feel vulnerable and so on. So but you're saying the false self, you're saying that the false self is, is, is that false, sorry, is the true self that, that three, four, five, six, seven-year-old boy? Or can it be related yeah, to that? The true, seven? The, the true self is the child as it throws. When the false self takes over, it's age six, seven, eight, nine, ten. When the false self takes over, it uh, it freezes, uh, it disables the the true self, and then the true self um, ossifies, simply ossifies like a fossil. It ossifies and and remains in hibernation. It's cryogenically hibernated, and then when it emerges, it emerges frozen in time, as it as it were at that time. So does it not know? So <clears throat> is it the case that your true self might really hate a particular kind of food or might really hate heights or whatever? The, the what I just told you. Uh, the false self hated pets. It's a real case that I'm working with right now. Mm-hmm. The false self hated pets, but I mean virulently, viscerally. Hated pets. Hated. And then the true self emerged. The guy went through a financial crisis. The true self emerged, and the true self loves pets. And so the guy bought a kitten and was playing with her. <laughs> That's just going to be a shock. Sleeping with, sleeping with her. Absolutely. These are two incompatible personalities. Hmm. Absolutely. That's what led me to, to speculate that narcissism may be a post-traumatic dissociative reaction. We know that uh, in extreme trauma, multiple personality develops usually as a reaction to extreme trauma. And usually the various alters, the various sub-personalities, are frozen in time. So you have a personality age 6, personality age 12, personality age 3. So all it is has its own time, its, its own clock. Wow. In multiple personality. That is very it's interesting. The same, it's the same with narcissists. The false self is, is uh, alive, but the, the true self is frozen in time. It has its own clock. So that's, and it is, so that's actually and it is kind of, usually diametrically opposed to the false self. So that's actually really interesting. That the false self emerged to compensate for the shortcomings of the true self. Hmm. So the false self would define himself itself by opposition to the true self. Wow. It really is Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Like it's yeah, like a manufactured I, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. It doesn't have to be good and evil. The false self could be No, but I'm not saying that, I'm not saying it's good and evil. I'm saying it, it is the case that one I have twins, you must understand. So for and this actually did happen. My daughter, when she was seven years old, I'm all you know. It became clear that she was defining herself as I am that which is not my brother. So if he likes if he likes vanilla ice cream, I have to like chocolate. If he likes math, I have to like reading. Like it was, like the personality was trying so hard to figure out what makes me different when I've got this other person who's always around and is always the same size. Exactly. You know, exactly. Who am I? Who am false I? Self, the false self says. The false self is saying, "This true self is stupid and weak and vulnerable. That's why it's it's being abused. That's why it's so helpless. That's why it cannot fight back. I hate this true self. It's I don't I never want to be this true self. 
I want to be everything this true self is not. I want to be strong. I want to be all-powerful. I want to be all-knowing. I want to be ever-present. I want to be famous. I want to be rich and so on. But uh, the negation is extensive. So it's everything the true self is not. So if the true self like pets, the false self cannot like pets because then it would mean that it has something in common with the true self. The false self can have nothing in common with the true self because everything it has in common with the true self is a chink in the armor. Wow. That is very interesting. So <clears throat> I should, I've taken up now two hours of your time and I feel, <laughs> I feel, feel somewhat guilty about yeah, that, but I'm very happy that I have. So what I would like, what I would like to ask is this, given the fact that it's very hard to find a therapist that has a background in this and you do work with a, a number of therapists, can people contact you and say, um, I think I have narcissistic personality disorder or I, something's going on with me and I think you might have. I'd like to have your recommendation for a therapist to work with. Can you provide that, or do you no. work with patients directly, or how does that work? I work with the with usually victims of abuse directly, but not as a therapist, which I'm not. Right, but and I'm I never recommend I never recommend therapists because things can go awry, relationships can deteriorate, and then I'll be blamed for it. Which, mm -hmm. you know, something I'm looking forward to. So you usually only work so. I don't know. I just, I'm going to go to hell and I realize I'm, you know, it identifies me as codependent, which is totally unfair and I don't think it should be the case. But I really think it should be, I think narcissists deserve a therapist. Like, just like one, one in the world who yes, says, I, think, I, think I don't so think we should get rid of you. I think so too. Regrettably, there aren't too many, if any. <laughs> okay, and well... So Narcissists are left to, to... Narcissists are actually in much worse position than victims of narcissists. Yes, victims I agree. Narcissists have their own forums, they have support, they have understanding of society, they have therapists working with them. Many of them are codependent, which is codependence, is a well-known category with well-known treatment modalities developed over decades. So victims are in much better shape than narcissists. Narcissists can't find succor and support anywhere, advice anywhere. They are demonized, they are castigated, they are avoided by the, even by professionals because they are really difficult patients and so on. So they are, you know, left to fend. But narcissists are used to it. That's what they develop their false self to start with. <laughs> that's just horrible though, right? I mean, that's yeah. just absolutely extension horrible. Of, <laughs> extension of early childhood abuse. <laughs> But it's true, though. I mean, that's what's sad. It's like, yeah, well, they're tough. They can take it. <laughs> it's like, well, not really. <laughs> All right. I had an amazing time. Um, okay, Nancy. Thank, thank you very thank much. Thank you for your time and everything. I had a great time. Thank you very much. I very much enjoyed it, sir. Keep in touch. Take care, man. Thank you.